On Wednesday morning, we began the conference with the end. And we heard from people who talked about the end of oil, which really meant the end of the economy, the end of the environment. And here we are three days later, and we are ending the conference with the beginning. So the question to you, I pose again, as I did on Wednesday, are we living in a world of depletion and scarcity or in a world soon of abundance? Is this the end of the Mayan calendar or an inflection point to some kind of a new beginning? Are we living in a world soon of peak everything or a world of the rising billions? The question will go up on the screen and it poses again your choice. Are you pessimists or are you optimists? And we'll see if anything that transpired over the last three days has changed your minds at all. So you've got to get your devices, power them on, and follow the prompt. Shouldn't that say everything is coming up Moses? Okay, is that the previous? Can anyone remember? Yes. That was the first one, right? Okay. And now, right. They're exactly the same results. Exactly the same results. <laughs> 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 Well, that was worth the effort. <laughs> I think the politicians of the country better take note. It's not that easy to change people's minds. <laughs> All right. Well, there we are. <laughs> I was waiting for the big reveal. <laughs> okay. Well, we have one last treat for you, one last speaker. She needs no introduction. Her name is Jan Arden. Yeah. She's been with us throughout has paid very careful attention and will now give us her erudite analysis of what has transpired. I think I need to go over aneurysm symptoms and stroke <laughs> symptoms because I felt them both during the last three days. Thank you, Moses. Visit the bookstore. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who, who don't know me, I, I do want to tell you just a little bit about myself. I am an environmentally aware, agnostic, God-fearing Jewish possibilian. I am a pot smoker who occasionally hires an asexual dominatrix, very difficult. Uh, we usually do it on a 3D copier machine. I like my petri dish meat medium well. Um, and I do like oysters because they're very... <sighs> and I am generally cheery. Um, this first slide is my mom and her friend, Gerda. Uh, on talking to my mom, when we looked at this slide, I, my mom said, well, my God, I don't even know why I had a green beer. And I said, well, it, it could have been St. Patrick's Day. Well, for God's sakes, it was probably St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> my mom's friend, Gerda, and her husband go on a lot of cruises with my parents. And my job description is about to change what I have been doing for the last 35 years of my life. I'm still going to try and do it to the very best of my ability but I'm going to start looking after these people. I have moved my parents 50 yards from my house. I have an acreage west of Calgary. 
That's my dad and Gerda's husband, Ron. I don't know if married couples start looking alike after a while, <laughs> but they both have their pocket protectors. <laughs> they both have hats. When uh, my mom saw them come down to the breakfast deck <clears throat> on their first day of this particular cruise, my mom says, Daryl, people are gonna think you're gay. <laughs> With Ron. Uh, my dad, my mom was a saint growing up. My dad was the God damn it guy. God damn it, Jesus Christ, do not use my God damn good lumber. I'm nine, I don't have an effing clue what a good board looks like from a bad board, but I personally thought my name was Jesus and my older brother thought his name was God damn it. It was very confusing. <laughs> so that was my mom and dad. This is the three people that they created. There's myself, my younger brother Patrick, who we adopted at 10 days old, and my older brother in the striped shirt, DeRay, has been in prison for 20 years this year from first degree murder. So my mom always says, Jan, we are not the only weird family. There are weirder families than us out there. And I'm like, well, they're getting slimmer and slimmer as the years go by. Um, my, my younger brother is, we're a little bit estranged. He has two twin boys. Um, they are both very sick. They're uh, just about to have their 12th birthday. One is severely autistic, and one has cystic fibrosis. Um, and what I want to talk about to, to, you know, to end this whole thing is just the insignificance of moments that have all kind of tugged together like a rope to create my life. There was no big bang that happened. I wasn't discovered in a nightclub. I have always done what I've done. There's no magic tricks, there wasn't any auditions. I just started doing what I did and I've never looked back. Every time I tried to get away from it, it dragged me back. This woman is my grandmother, my father's mother. She introduced me to religion. Um, that is a perm that my mom gave me. I got it in 11th grade and I just got the ends of it cut out two weeks ago. My grandmother introduced me to Mormonism. My father was raised Mormon. I wanted you to get a better look at the, at the perm. I am following the instructions on the box. <laughs> but my grandmother, she told me, and look how small my boobs were. Um, my grandmother told me about God and about remaining steadfast. She scared the living hell out of me because she basically said to me, Jan, Jesus sees you everywhere you go, everything you do. Jesus, the Lord, our God, sees you. And I swear to you, in my mother's life, for one year, I peed and pooed under a towel. <laughs> I took a towel off the rack, and I placed it on my lap because I was mortified um, about Jesus seeing me poo. And <laughs> I, I, you know, it was, I had all these things going on in my life. But I was generally so frightened, and you know, starting my period was a whole other. It, if only I'd had an aluminum maxi pad, I could have really made the most of that. Um, I, I always sang. When I, I probably started singing before I started talking, I have no idea why. It was something that was just, I was always humming and making up tunes, so music was always tinkering around. But by the time I got to be this age, and this is one of my very few public performances in the living room. My parents didn't know that I sang a note or played the guitar until I was 18. And at that point, I'd written almost 300 songs. And I learned secretly from the time I was 11 years old in the basement. I couldn't tell anybody because I was embarrassed about it. I thought I was such a funny kid. And I was, I mean, I, my songs I, are not not depressing, FYI. They're very uplifting and motivating. Just don't operate heavy machinery when you're listening to one of my records. But I, um, I always wrote about people dying. My parents died in the first 10 songs that I wrote. It was just, that's what I had a propensity to do, was write really, really sad songs. Um, but I did have to let my, my parents in on, oh God, um, in on the fact that I was really musical and that I was interested in it. And my mom said to me, well, you know, someone like you, 
I, it's just gonna be a disappointment. But she was right. They were very realistic. It's not that they didn't think I was great. I mean, in the same breath, my mom would say to me, Jan, you're as good as Anne Murray. <laughs> and my dad would say, you're the steadiest, sturdiest goddamn singer in Canada. <laughs> but uh, that's my family. That's one of the few afternoons, probably on a Saturday, when my dad was home. He was pretty, well, I don't even know what happened there. That's. Uh, I apparently couldn't handle my liquor, but I was just about to say that my dad was drunk for 25 years. So when I was growing up, it was very rare to see my dad standing in the yard with us. Um, he, he just, he was working really hard. It was probably very different in the 60s and 70s. Dads just kind of, you know, they were there, but they weren't there. My dad really wasn't there. My mom did everything for us. She was our saving grace. She was absolutely the... She was just the glue that held our family together. I, um, you know, I don't, re I have no animosity towards my dad at all. He worked really hard, but he also gave me an incredible worth e work ethic, believe it or not. He said, the harder you work, Jan, the luckier you were going to get. Um, whenever I did have a conversation with my father, he was always talking to me in sound bites. I never really... I never had a conversation with the man. Um, he just, it was sound bites, and I think that's what his dad gave him. So he, would, he was the one that was always telling me, you can absolutely do anything you want, Jan. Just set your sights. So I think I just, in the back of my mind, thought, well, why the hell not? I had no plan at all to sing. I just kept singing. This is my mom, my angel of a mother, who told me that no matter what happened, life was going to be very hard, but it was my job to throw my shoulders back and see what was coming. You gotta stand in the doorway and see what's coming to get you. There's no sense standing there and not seeing what's coming to get you. You get a drink in your hand and you face the sun and you just get on with it. <laughs> she is out every morning brushing their dogs. Once a month they get vacuumed. My mother vacuums our family dogs. This, I am very jealous of Michael Buble. I would be remiss not to put this in. I did try to kill him a year ago. Um, because I'm very jealous. The man in the last 10 years has sold 60 million records, which is 57.3 million more records than I have. So yeah, I did try to kill him. And actually, we were together filming an ad for Nasal strips and uh, it never went anywhere because of the restraining order i was never able to go forward <laughs> with that my um it's very interesting when i when i finally did get into singing in bars and 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 actually doing it in front of people which i didn't do for many many years um fast forward i did end up with a record deal and um, I remember being, having my first sort of little hit in the United States, and I was in the back of a limousine um, with the president of the company, who I should tell you was 350 pounds and smoking a cigar, and um, he's, you know, he said to me, you're 30 pounds away from superstardom in this country. And I didn't know what to say. I kind of got out of the car, and I went upstairs, and I talked to my mom, and I got her on the phone. I phoned her from Los Angeles, and she said, why didn't you tell him you didn't want to put any more weight on? My parents have just been this force to be reckoned with. Like here in this picture, I'm, I'm bending over secretly calling my mom, that's Anne Murray in the backstroke. And she had just finished saying the F word. She slammed back a rum and coke and threw her cigarette just out of the <laughs> side of the shot. And I phoned my mom, I went, holy shit, mom. That, if you're gonna have one drink a day, just do the one big one. But I, my parents have been every bit of my success. I'm standing here more for humor than I, than I really am for any kind of musical attributes I might have had. I love music. I can't take any responsibility even for writing music because it just, I sit down and I get an idea and I jot it down. I don't read music. I have no clue what the sticks and dots mean. I couldn't tell you what any of it is. My whole theory was if it sounds like something, chances are that it is. Um, 
But this whole thing, like I was saying, what I have to do now is go forward and, and make sure that my parents are looked after. They're in their late 70s. They are the love of my life. They're actually the heart that beats in my chest. And I don't even know what this means. <laughs> I saw a doll and I tried to mimic the doll. It was right after an Idea City session, I think. <laughs> Talking about the Hubble telescope finding 30 billion new universes in a spot the size of a thumb. Yeah. <sighs> but I have to, I mean, everyone seems to kind of put their parents somewhere that's very on the periphery of their lives and people are like, oh my God, doesn't it drive you crazy to live so close to your parents? I wish I would have moved them next to me five or six years ago. I wish I would have, um, or even 10 years ago. I just, I didn't have the balls to do it. I, I was just like, oh, they're gonna be, you know, in my life and knocking on the door. Um, they both have a little bit of health issues. My mom's got a pacemaker. She's had lots of heart issues. My dad's had a couple of strokes. My mom says, well, I wish you would have had a stroke 30 years ago because it's like sleeping with a stranger. <laughs> so they're just... <sighs> well, he sleeps with one foot on the floor now. It's the weirdest thing, but it's not bad. It's not bad. But he... <laughs> My parents are just, they've been amazing neighbors to me. They've been absolutely stunning, stellar neighbors. This is, the show must go on. I had to give one of my co-writers a plaque, and I was in the hospital for something. I think I'd just given birth to the triplets. <laughs> and that's my friend Connie. I mean, the show literally must go on. I don't even know how that got in there. I must have put it in there, huh? I must have been drinking that beer, and I put that slide in there. That's what happened. But I'm... I don't know what it's going to be like in the next few years. I mean, I do have a, I'm still so busy singing. I just finished touring. I've been writing music for 35 years. This is a security guy. I keep with me. He's just in the back. I, I, try and, I try and be under the radar with that security shit because I don't like it when people are so obvious. So, like, if I go to Costco, um, he goes with me. And uh, I'm just like, get out of my effing way. I need to get that very large box of tampons. And uh, yeah, it's paid for. Uh, Preston Manning actually subsidizes him for me. So that's been really, really great. Everyone should have one. It's just one of the perks. Uh, when you're an international sensation like myself, I'm huge here in Canada and in Latvia, and I don't think a lot of people really know that. Um, so yes, that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be looking after my parents. The one perk of having them, well, there's many, many perks, but I have a 7-Eleven right next to me. Mom, do you have any basil? I've got dried, fresh, packed in ice. What do you want? Just come over and get it. Uh, I'm in uh, Prime Minister Harper's pool area, and that's my dog, Mitty. We get kicked out of places all the time. And um, we were, I was going to throw her into the pool, but uh, then the assistant behind me said, don't throw her in. We've had problems with the pool. And I'm like, I don't know what the Prime Minister is doing with the pool, but I ain't going in there. I have no idea. And he blames it on the Trudeau years. I, I don't even know. But he said no one has ever swam in that pool. Um, I have had an amazing 25-year run in my life. It has just been one seemingly insignificant thing after another that have led me to, I got Mitty her own train, because that's how loaded I am. <laughs> but I have just <laughs> had just the most fun. I've, it's been tough with my brother, but my parents have showed me about compassion and forgiveness and being forthright and being open-minded. You know, my dad told me the universe is ever expanding. Can you imagine that, Jan? They were always so open about things. Everything I've heard in the last few days, I think my parents would love it so much. I just want to leave you with one little thing that happened to me probably 25 years ago, and it's so simple. But it changed the whole course of my life from the time I turned 15, and I was riding the lawnmower, the ride-on lawnmower, and I was going around the yard. We've always lived out of town. We've always, we've, we've, I've been out of town since I was a little kid, but I went by a water barrel, and um, I just sort of rode by, and there was two moths circling around in the barrel. 
And I went forward about 10 feet, and I don't know what it was that stopped me. I just stopped it and shut it off and got off the lawnmower, and I went back, and I looked around, and I got a stick, and I fished them both out. They were going around and around and around, and I just, I don't know what even struck me. It's a moth. I hate moths. I crashed a car trying to swat a moth out of my way, but I fished them out, and I set them on a rock, and it changed the way I thought for the rest of my life. I had such a sense of pride for the rest of the day and such a sense of accomplishment. I got back on the mower and I thought, I hope you make it. And that's just the, the, the power that's given to all of us as, as human beings, as seemingly crazy as that sounds. For the next, I still think about those two moths and fishing them out. And it, it shapes me into the person that I am every day and how I behave every day. So I want to just thank you all for um, listening and laughing and and this has been a trip for me this last few days i'm telling you what i don't i'm gonna i'm going back to school <laughs> thank you have a wonderful time with a down child blues band wait 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 those of you who haven't seen it was that a good issue? Well, in, in 10 years, I'm going to show my front, but I'm going to need tape. <laughs> this is what Jan is speaking about. Another first. <laughs> there you are, Jan. My mom said, you look like a cherub. <laughs> my parents have enabled me to do everything I've done in my life. They've been so funny and so fair. And you've been so brave and so wonderful to be Thank here. You. Thank wow. you so much. You must be Moses. I am. <laughs>